there. Thanks for listening to Let's Talk Withdrawal, a weekly discussion on antidepressants and the issues surrounding them. Hello, this is James. Welcome to episode 10 of Let's Talk Withdrawal, a new weekly podcast discussing antidepressants. This week, we have an interview with Kevin P. Miller. Kevin is a filmmaker, writer, and journalist, and his films have won numerous international film and television awards. In 2009, Kevin wrote and directed Generation RX. The film presents the whole story about the prescribing of psychiatric medications for children and questions whether we've forced millions of children onto pharmaceutical drugs for commercial rather than scientific reasons. In 2015, Kevin followed up on this story with letters from Generation RX. The film reflects the stories of thousands of people who wrote to Kevin to share their experiences taking psychiatric drugs. Their gripping tales are combined with the latest mental health research, science and medical health perspectives. I strongly urge you to seek out and watch these films to understand the reality that many families find themselves facing. The powerful stories of these families who followed the advice of their doctors and went on to face devastating consequences is compelling. I was keen to ask Kevin about his approach to making the films and his thoughts on treatment approaches for mental health conditions. Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Firstly, for the listeners, could you give us a little bit about your background and how you came to make the films Generation RX in 2009 and Letters from Generation RX in 2015? Well, that's a, that, that is a long story. So <laughs> I'll just suffice it to say that I grew up even in high school as a student of journalism. Mm-hmm. And at those early uh, uh, years and my teen years, uh, I was really taught the the principles of journalism. And so I tended to head towards things that were social justice issues. And I wrote a lot about real people. You know, fast forward a couple of decades, and I was doing research for another film in the 1990s uh, that was narrated by James Earl Jones. Your listeners may uh, know James Earl Jones as Darth Vader, the voice of Darth Vader in Star Wars, of course. And so anyway, I was in the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and I was researching some material for that film. And I first came across these uh, videotapes that were the 1991 Prozac hearings in Washington. And so I watched these uh, in horror as Americans got up before their government government before the uh, Food and Drug Administration and others and said, you know, my mother killed my father. My sister committed suicide two weeks on to Prozac and all of these horrific stories. And of course, I mean, I could not uh, use the material for the film that I was producing at the time in 1993, 94, but it never escaped me. And so Fast forward another 10 or 12 years, and I was in D.C. again filming some things in in Congress and then went to another place, and there were some hearings. And suffice it to say that that I realized that I had stumbled into a meeting of the Food and Drug Administration. I had my cameraman filming. I was busily writing something on my computer. And about five minutes in, I was saying to myself, my God, where have I heard all these stories before and it and it struck me that oh my god this is the same verbiage these are the same claims um, same tragic tales that i had seen on this 1991 videotape and so i realized at that point of course that nothing had changed and that led me to um, create the first film generation rx which uh, as you say was released in very early 2009 I wanted to ask you, that scene in Letters from Generation RX where you present footage from that hearing of people testifying about the horrific things that had happened to themselves and their families, watching it I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. It was visceral. I just wondered how you felt when you saw that footage for the first time. Well, my goodness. I mean, it it was a very powerful reaction, uh, not unlike yours. It's um, it's one of the things that drove me forward. It, it stayed with me, as I said, for that you know, 10, 12 years until I had inadvertently stumbled onto another meeting where I was hearing the same thing. 
to me, that was the tragedy, that there had been no progress or so little progress that it wasn't even palpable on the topic of antidepressants and suicide and violence that, that could come as a result of, of taking these drugs. So it was the same reaction. As a matter of fact, someone just said to me yesterday who saw the, who saw the film, uh, she said, it must have ripped your heart out to produce this film. And indeed, it, you know, it truly did. And I, I labored with it. We, we fought very difficult funding situation. In addition to those challenges, which obviously make fil- filmmaking very, very, uh, very difficult, the emotional aspect of it was very hard because I felt a responsibility not only to the people who I interviewed, mm-hmm. of course, but the, the larger group of the public that either had no idea or who had suffered in silence, thinking perhaps that it was them. Oh my God, I am crazy. Instead of realizing, of course, that in many, many, many thousands and millions of cases, that uh, it was the drugs that were causing these awful um, reactions. Well, Kevin, I can certainly attest to the power of the film in conveying that. I also wanted to ask you about Tilda Swinton's narration, she sounds completely engaged with and affected by the drama that she is describing. I wondered if she shared any insights with you about how she approached narrating with so much power and emotion. Well, that's a beautiful story in itself That that's a little long, but I will tell you, James, that Tilda was amazing. And even though we were working very much long distance, I was actually in in Victoria, British Columbia uh, at the time, and she was in Scotland. And so, you know, I was up at five in the morning recording her and I think it was what, one or two o'clock in in Scotland. And, you know, the the whole means of of getting her was, was really cool because my preference was that I wanted a very powerful female to represent my script. And part of the reason being is that the funny thing about words, when one writes them on a paper or, or speaks them, is that they have their own energy, of course, right? Yeah. And so in my case, I feared desperately that if I had a, a male narrator, then it would have too much male energy. It would be, the words would be too aggressive. Yet someone as brilliant as Tilda Swinton Uh, narrating sort of sucked the air right out of that male energy and just put it in very put the words in very human terms and of course she she's not only won oscars but been nominated for other oscars uh and and won hundreds of awards at this point in her career uh so she is truly brilliant um but i i remember how i got to her i think and how blessed that I felt when she had uh, agreed to narrate it. Initially, I thought it was going to slip away and that she wasn't going to do it, and in part because of all of the misunderstandings around these issues. And so I finally wrote her a very passionate letter and and told her why I, I visioned her early on in the process of narrating the film. And uh, a few hours later, fortunately for me, and more importantly for the film, uh, she agreed. So it was just a it was just a true honor and privilege to work with her. And and yes, she was engaged, and yes, she was very passionate. That does come across very strongly. She really sounded like a psychiatric survivor herself. Well, listen, I mean, the key to this, and I think even with Generation Rx, and we had David Suchet, who, of course, is a, just a, a, another brilliant actor, stage actor mainly from, from uh, London, who, did, who narrated uh, Generation Rx. And, you know, there's that fine line because you don't want there to be too much emotion because the, the film is kind of like uh, nonstop emotion in certain ways and so that balance is something that you 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 really can't coach someone to that degree and um, I mean she and I of course did have exchanges about how I saw the words you know coming out in certain sections but she's so brilliant that uh, she must have felt it in her own way not only professionally but personally and as I said, she just she just did an amazing job. Thank you. I'd like to move on to talk about reaction to the film. I wondered how you found the reaction of the medical community, and in particular pharmaceuticals, given that there is some acceptance now of the risks involved and the lack of truth about these drugs. I wondered how that was represented to you. In many forms, in many ways. Uh, 
there's still a great deal of denial within the medical community around this. People that you would expect would wholly uh, support letters from Generation Rx, even from within the community of, quote, survivors, if you will. Um, the, the response has kind of varied. You get a lot of resistance. I've been fighting this battle, if you will, to expose certain aspects of certain drugs or certain classes of drugs uh, within pharmaceutical realm for 20 plus years. <clears throat> and so um, and that means the FDA as well. And so there's really not too much that could get thrown by me. To use an American baseball terms, you know, it's very hard to throw a curveball by me at this point because I've heard so much of, of it and seen the arguments repeated historically over a period of 25, 30 years. And so, the, you know, there are there are some brave medical doctors and psych, psychiatrists who truly did embrace the film and empathized uh, in the in the greatest degree to the uh, to the people and the, their patients and others, but largely, I mean, the, the response is to is a non response. I'll never forget when Generation RX came out and and the first day that the DVDs were available in early two thousand nine. Mm -hmm. The first day that they came out, there were uh, I believe it was twenty three orders from drug companies and or their PR firms. And that was the first day. So I think they wanted to see the film and then say, oh, just in case we've got to know what this guy is doing in case somehow he becomes, you know, some kind of Michael Moore figure or something. They wanted to be aware. But in truth, they never took, a, they never took any shots directly at me. And in large measure, I think that's because the film did not allow them. There was it didn't allow them the space to to criticize the film. I didn't use conjecture. I used scientific data. I used the stories of real people. I used the stories of experts, and you know across Europe and North America. And so there really wasn't one thing that they could say. Oh, this is false. This is patently false. He's misrepresenting the data. So they had no space to attack me. And it's kind of the same way now, but in this film, I had the audacity, of course, to tell the story of the of the Stefan family as one of my stories. And there are a family from Canada, the, the, the mother, um, I hate using the word committed suicide, but for ease of understanding, that's what I'll use. She took her life and... You know, then the the two children seem to be showing similar symptoms later on when they became young teens, and one was put in a, in a mental hospital, and the other was very violently bipolar. And so they started to study nutrition to see whether or not nutrition could make any difference whatsoever in their quote mental health end quote. And indeed, it did, and it's one of the dramatic stories in the film. But people seem to be outraged that I had the again the audacity to to share a story, and uh, the fact that it was surrounding vitamins, minerals, and and amino acids, <laughs> and that this family and now many thousands of others have been cured almost solely by focusing on exercise and nutrition um, of their symptoms. So this caused a great outcry, and people are. You know, I've had MDs say to me, including people who are prominent uh, anti-psychiatry psychiatrists, come up to me and argue with me about this and, you know, say, I'm, I'm very concerned that you are putting this information out to people about nutrition and mental health. And so we would argue back and forth and I'd say, but why? Will this harm anyone? And they invariably come back and say, no, it won't harm anyone. And I'm like, well, then what's the big deal? First, do no harm, doctor, to which they all acknowledge, okay, first do no harm. But they somehow want to, you know, again, the, the medical profession wants, wants to pretend that the information on benzos or antipsychotics or antidepressants or Ritalin or the methylphenidate drugs for ADHD, they want to hide behind this cloak of scientific credibility. And the fact of the matter is, is that scientific credibility regarding their their drugs does not exist. So, you know, it, it's kind of outrageous to me, and I did battle with a pharmacist in Toronto at a big audience about this briefly, was that, you know, when you're when you're telling people that they don't have the right to know 
that what food and you know vitamins and herbs and whatever that they put in their mouths, how it affects or could affect potentially their mental health symptoms. I think it's wholly irresponsible, and yet they um, you know they continue to resist. And the other thing I think worth pointing out on this, we've come to this point where there are millions of people being harmed because information about the lack of scientific veracity behind these uh, psychotropic drugs being shared that, you know, they want to call out this quackery idea. But, you know, truly the quackery is the, is the nonsensical scientific studies that have been put forth to FDA, yeah. to MHRA, to, to so many agencies around the world that they allow them to, by the slimmest of slim margins, to meet the scientific criteria for their claims, and then they just get dispensed, and then there's no follow-up. I mean, I, I, I read somewhere that, you know, yesterday that, that in terms of Viagra, <clears throat> of course, not a mental health drug, but in terms of Viagra here in the United States, that $58 million worth of taxpayer money was used to get those drugs passed. And we know that that number is probably 10 times that for these mental health drugs. And, and so we as taxpayers are paying for this. And um, at the same time, they, the governments, the agencies representing refuse to, to spend two pounds on studying the effects of nutrition on the body whether it's for heart drugs or mental health drugs. Yeah. And I think that this is tremendously irresponsible. Yeah. And uh, I've been fighting against this kind of a lone, <laughs> a lone voice in the wilderness for a long time now. It's a sad state of affairs, isn't it, when quackery can be supported by many millions worth of advertising and PR? No doubt. And, and you know, just sheer unbridled capitalism. And I don't mean to sound like a socialist or something, but I mean, this is where we're at. The things that are happening around the world, no matter where you're at politically, you know, when you have Brexit, when you have Donald Trump being elected as president of the United States, part of it is all entangled in, in all of the, a lot of issues. Another issue I've been speaking out about for many years and, and writing about for many years is free trade. Free trade is, and free trade, quote, agreements are entangled with healthcare. And, you know, when, when people are losing their jobs, when they can find, they can't find good jobs to support their families, they get tense and anxious and angry. And, you know, the same thing applies with healthcare, particularly with with these mental health drugs. So we are telling, we are allowing the medical community and the drug companies to tell the victims of people who, are, who have suffered awful side effects, either themselves or a family member or someone they love. And we allow the, the, the government and the pharmaceutical companies to say to victims that, no, it's not our drugs. It's all in your brain. It's you. It's not our drugs. It's you. And so we've come to this point where we have tens of millions of people who have been victimized by the side of the real effects of these drugs. And the, the government and the agencies refuse to listen. In the meantime, in Great Britain, you're cracking down on glucosamine sulfate, which is a natural substance that I use and have been using for my arthritic knee for 15 or 18 years now without the use of any drugs. And so you have this real disconnect between government and representatives and the people who are saying, my God, I lost my son or my husband or my wife or daughter. And not only is it happening, but we're seeing there's a broad community worldwide where this is happening. And you refuse to listen to us and make changes. And you're still supporting the strident claims of drug companies who have nothing but profit in mind. So, I mean, this is, you know, how it's all entangled. It's very complex. As our new president uh, said a few weeks ago, healthcare is very complicated. And related to what the future looks like, in past interviews, I've heard you talk about medical freedom of choice. And I just wondered what you felt would need to change in our healthcare systems for that to become a reality. 
Well, I think first and foremost is something uh, we, we discussed a few minutes ago. You know, in the film, we've got an example of the Stefan family and their pursuit of studies, real, honest to God, scientific studies about nutrition and mental health. And and the um, the government of Alberta in Canada had given the, this company $500,000 to study this responsibly, scientifically. And then their version of the FDA, Health Canada, came in and, and quite literally pulled the money away. And so we need to devote money towards studying the effects of nutrition. I mean, instead of constantly taking the fight to people when they say, you know what, I want to eat more organics, or I don't really like having, you know, genetically modified organisms in my food, unless I can see the real honest scientific studies about that, or the effects of herbs, or as I say, vitamins, or amino acids, or minerals. I mean, we should be devoting money towards nutrition. It's so silly to me that when you have quite literally trillions of dollars being invested in healthcare across the world, that we cannot see fit as a society, as societies, to realize the need to study the other side and to study nutrition wholly. I mean, that's really a big part of what I see medical freedom of choice. Uh, is meaning. I've never once advocated that Prozac should be taken off the market. Never. Uh, A lot of people accuse me of that, but it's not true. I've never once said that any of these drugs should be taken off the market. What should be provided to them is all of the science that I've revealed in the last two of my films and more. All of the government financed studies should be made available to people in real language. And then study nutrition, study nutrition's effect on arthritis, on heart health, on mental health, and then let the chips fall where they may. And that, if we just did that alone, if we would dedicate a few percentage points of our trillions of dollars we spend on conventional medical care across the world, we would see millions of people get better. I agree. There are many routes to good health, aren't there? But we seem to be focusing all of our efforts on the one that has the most potential for harm and that generates the most profit. Indeed. And just to illustrate this, go back to 1990s when I started a lot of this research. And I'll never forget an FDA hearing, a Food and Drug Administration hearing in the United States talking about folic acid, a B vitamin. And there were these big hearings in The then commissioner of the FDA, David Kessler, Dr. David Kessler, was arguing vehemently about trying to make sure we got the dosage recommendation levels right. And if we didn't get the dosage levels on folic acid right, millions of people could die, including the elderly. Now, the reason this is important is that those hearings were held in 1995 or something, and you know, we knew in 1981 or 82 that just 400 micrograms of folic acid taken by women of childbearing age could prevent what are called neural tube birth defects mm-hmm. or spina bifida. And yet in 1995, the US FDA could not see their way clear to tell people or to recommend to women of childbearing age that they take this 400 microgram capsule that would have cost less than a penny to prevent spina bifida. And instead, their big solution was, two years later, in 1997, was to fortify this food supply with synthetic folic acid. So anyway, it's just the madness of this. I mean, seriously, you you take a whole bottle of folic acid and it would have cost you, you know, less than a dollar. These people cannot see their way clear to tell, to save lives. And so as a result, from that period of when we found out that folic acid prevented spina bifida in over 99% of the cases, scientifically proven, that in that 15, 16, 17-year period, 30 to 50,000 cases of kids born with spina bifida could have been prevented for a penny a day. These are the extremes that our representatives and those in the medical community have gone to to prevent our access 
to this information so that we can truly have medical freedom of choice and make up our own minds. Kevin, could you tell us what's next for the film? Well, I mean, if you don't mind, I'd like to tell people that if they'd like to get on a mailing list for Letters from Generation Rx, they can they can do so at lettersfromgenerationrx.com. Uh, we've just signed a distribution deal uh, with uh, actually with a, a great distribution company out of the United Kingdom. And so I'm quite happy about that. We are creating two additional versions of the film uh, aimed at TV, so two different lengths. And so I'm thrilled about that. And so people cannot, unfortunately, go out and see the film right now. I did have it online, as you as you know, for about six months for free because I wanted people in, in, in this community and others to be able to access the information without having to worry about the cost of doing so. But now that we've signed this deal, um, people can go to lettersfromgenerationrx.com, just put in their email address, and we will provide updates um, uh, when the film will be available, where it might be showing in your area, um, when DVDs, Blu-rays, et cetera, are available. So the only other thing is that if people want to be in touch with me, I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty uh, easy to get a hold of. My moniker, if you will, is Kevin P. Miller, uh, P for Philip, Kevin P. Miller. And that's true across Twitter and our Facebook pages uh, as well. We also have a Facebook page that's, you know, facebook.com slash letters from Generation Rx, where people can get additional news stories and information about, quote, mental health. Well, I for one can't wait to get the Blu-ray because I want as many family and friends to experience the power of this film as possible. It's an extraordinary work and it deserves all of the plaudits and more. It's the most scintillating 90 minutes of film that I've ever seen. Well, that's very kind and... and you know, that's the kind of the bottom line. I mean, I'm hoping that when people are exposed to it, that they, they are glued and that they are enraptured, if you will. Mm. And that importantly, they will share the film and share the information in the film and know that they can trust the information in the film. Mm. And if, if they do so, and if we can turn this, uh, this situation around where we drug first and ask questions later, um, then I will feel absolutely complete and know that all of the sacrifice and uh, research and 20-hour um, days were well worth it. And they were well worth it anyway because it was my honor to feature the stories of so many wonderful people um, in this film. So Letters from Generation Rx is certainly nothing that I would ever regret. Um, and I guess it's up to everyone else now to see how, how widely this uh, this film gets shared world, worldwide. I'm really excited to hear that there's distribution agreed for the film because it needs the oxygen of publicity and it needs to move to a place where people can watch at home and then talk about the implications. In my experience, the film demands discussion after viewing. And that's what we want. And hopefully I'll be able to you know see you on, uh, on your turf. Uh, I, I do hope to have various screenings uh, throughout the UK and, and Europe and so as those things develop, you know, that that would be a, a lovely outcome. Mm. And, um, you know, that's that's really what we do want, uh, both on an academic level and on a consumer level. We need those kinds of conversations. It's obvious that we have not done a good job and that we can't continue to ignore the real effects that these drugs can have. Mm. And and by the way, you know, also not discount for the people who use them and truly believe in these psychotropic drugs, yeah. that they are helpful to them. And, and, you know, but as someone said to me once, James, they had been on these drugs, on SSRIs, on antidepressants for, I think, 10 years. And they, after seeing the film, they said, you know, it, it did identify for me that at one point that I was mentally going off and veering off in this very strange, uh, obsessive, sort of violent, dark, thought process. And all of a sudden, you know, your film <laughs> came into my mind and I was able to step outside of myself and say, wait a minute, where's the, where's that crazy thought coming from? Where's this darkness coming from? And they were able to actually make a connection like, wow, even though it's the first time I experienced these, or, or maybe, you know, the first couple of times I've experienced this darkness from, from taking an antidepressant, I was able to identify that the thoughts weren't from coming from me. Mm -hmm. And so, again, that's a really powerful thing. I mean, 
for people to be able to stop themselves or go to a loved one or call their doctor immediately or someone that they trust implicitly and say, you know what, we just changed my dose and I'm starting to get dark and violent thoughts um, and get help immediately before the the, uh, tragic event uh, happens. Well, Kevin, on a personal level, I just can't thank you enough for the attention that you've drawn to this over so many years and the personal commitment that you've made to helping people understand they have a choice in these matters and that their doctor isn't always right. Well, James, and I'm, 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 I'm very happy to see that you started this podcast and I uh, honor you for doing so. And perhaps we can uh, revisit once the film is actual in full di- actually in full distribution. Kevin, I'd really love that, and I'm so grateful to you for taking the time to talk to me. The podcast enables us to stand back and talk about the broader issues and educate from within, because we can't rely on medical science to get there for us, because they have no reason or compulsion to change. Well, that's right. And I, and again, lastly, I, I hope that people use the information in the film to question their doctors, to question their legislators, to, I mean, use the information in the film as a powerful tool, dare I say weapon, because it could be the thing that helps turn one's life around and turn this these awful tragedies into a greater understanding of where we need to be as people before we um, just dismiss the side effects of our brothers, sisters, neighbors um, while on these drugs. So again, I I thank you and I, I, I pray we do some good. I'm positive that we will as part of this community. And thank you so much for lending your views to this podcast. It's been great to talk to you today. Thank you, James. You as well, buddy. It was an honour and a pleasure to be able to chat to Kevin, and I hope that his words inspired you as much as they did me. Please join the mailing list at lettersfromgenerationrx.com and get hold of the film when it's released. It's a must-see for anyone that's had any involvement with psychiatric prescription drugs. Feedback. Feedback. I'd love to hear from you, so please get in touch. You can email me on feedback at jfmore.co.uk. Also, please tell your family and friends about this podcast. Whether they have experience with psychiatric prescription drugs or not, the more that are aware of this issue, the better, and you can really help that happen. Even better, if you like the podcast, please visit iTunes and leave us a review and a star rating. It takes a few minutes, but it makes a big difference to how many people listen in. Finally, if you're struggling with withdrawal yourself and don't know where to turn, there are some excellent resources listed on my website, jfmore.co.uk. Please go and have a look. Please do not increase, decrease, or stop your psychoactive prescription medication without the advice and support of a medical or mental health professional. Thanks for listening today and until next time, take care. Thank you so much for listening to Let's Talk Withdrawal. Come back next week for more news and views. If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review and subscribe in iTunes.